You know, before we uh, before I get started and uh, start talking or preaching, um, it's all the same to me. Um, <laughs> hey, I, I, I did want to say, I just want to say, we had a lot of people that have made Holy Week. We had a whole bunch of services this week and last Sunday, and some of you, a lot of you were here last Sunday, just had a terrific service. I just wanted to just, uh, just name some people, and then we could thank God for them all together. But, but our sound people, Pete and Mike, and our video people, Lisa Jones has spent a lot of time with fo- uh, pictures. And boy, we had some wonderful services this week and today. And, and Patrick's back there. All our musicians. And all our worship ser- services during the Holy Week are planned by Oleg and Pastor Jan. And I just think everybody's just done a terrific job. And i just like us to thank God for them. Thank you for them. Did, did I say all the musicians, too? Okay, okay. Well, he's, they have to be here the next service, too. So uh, if you want to fall asleep this service, uh, you know, you can't. Well, let me pray, and then we'll, we'll continue. God of grace, we thank you for stories and uh, for eyes that tell stories. And we pray that these ancient eyes from John and his community and the story that they tell would touch us today, that we might see the risen Lord this day, this Easter. In Christ's name we pray, amen. When I was in seminary, my wife taught preschool at Nassau Presbyterian Church, which is on the campus of Princeton uh, University. It's right there on the edge. And one of her favorite students, Laura, who was a three-year-old then, uh, uh, she was the son of one of the seminary professors, um, one day she was at the swings, and then she was on the, uh, off her swing, and she said, ooh. And my wife, Jean, saw that she was, uh, she saw a 19 or 20-year-old college student, a woman, walking to class, and she had bright, neon, lime green hair, which 23 years ago was, you know, really something. She's looking at it. My wife went over to Laura, and she said, Laura, do you think that woman was born with hair that color, or did she change it herself? And without dropping a beat, Laura said, oh, she was born with that hair color. Why would anybody do that to their hair? (laughs) She's a great kid. And there's there's another thing that happened, too. This is the one that I I really like and I want to talk about today. Just a question she asked once. And one day, her best friend, Mary Olenberger, Ben Olenberger was her dad, and he was my Old Testament professor. And Mary, Mary Olenberger was just crying her eyes out. And little Laura Taylor went over to her in the class, and she said, Mary, what do you want that you don't have? Isn't that nice? What do you want that you don't have? I love that question. In fact, you know, that's almost verbatim the exact same question that another Mary was asked 2,000 years ago at an empty tomb. Why are you weeping? What do you want? that you don't have. The thing is that Mary Magdalene wasn't simply asked a question. It wasn't a question like Mary Olenberger was asked a question. No, Mary of Magdalene, Mary of Magdala was being challenged to quit crying. And that's what Easter does. And it does it today. I want to tell you, I know when we look with our eyes out into the world, there's a lot that can make us weep but not this day. I know that in many ways it's a dark world, but you know what? It's a wonderful world too because Christ has redeemed it. And today I want to challenge you to open your eyes to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and wipe away every tear. You know, the Eastern Orthodox uh, Church has a tradition of telling jokes on Easter Monday, the day after uh, Easter. Well, it should be tomorrow. They gather at Starbucks, Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf, Panera, wherever they are. And they just let them go. And they just laugh and chortle and just have a great time. Because they're celebrating that God, in raising Jesus Christ from the dead, gets the last laugh. Jesus being raised is the ultimate punchline against death and the devil. And yet, in our lesson this morning, you've got Mary just wailing away at the tomb. And John keeps mentioning it. I don't know if you caught this. Here, you know, a little, many of you know I love spending a lot of time in the Bible, but there's, uh, John is the only one that, in John's gospel, the only place that we hear about somebody crying at the, at the, at the tomb. Uh, there are four stories of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the others beside John, they talk about a lot of emotion, 
like amazement and fear and joy, but nobody's crying. John lets us in and gives this picture of Mary crying. He keeps hammering it. In one verse, he tells us that she's at the tomb outside weeping. And in the next verse, she leans over to look in the tomb, and what's she doing? She's weeping. And then she's talking with some angels, and what do they ask her? Why are you weeping? And just two verses later, Jesus comes by. She doesn't recognize him, and he asks her the same question. What do you want that you don't have? Jesus is gentle, he's empathetic, but you get the picture. Get with it, woman. No tears today. Now, that's not to say when we look out at our world that there aren't plenty of reasons to weep. In fact, there are. There are a lot of good reasons to weep in our world. You just pick up the newspaper, get on the web, turn on the tube, Darfur, Kenya, you guys paying attention to what's going on there? One of the most stable places in Africa? <laughs> War, we know all about that. And closer to home, broken relationships, addictions. I mean, there isn't a person sitting in this room that isn't related to someone that battles alcohol or a drug or you yourself aren't recovering. We know there's a lot to weep about. I heard from a friend recently out of state and their marriage is falling apart, just breaks my heart. Three weeks ago, I was at a workshop, a faith roundtable on uh, human trafficking in San Diego County. And I want to tell you, the web of prostitution, pornography, and human trafficking and slavery is it's just horrifying. If we don't weep when we look at our world, there's something wrong. And yet today, I want to challenge you, no more tears, not today. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to give you the old uh, British stiff upper lip. I remember when I was a kid and I was crying and I got that worn out phrase. I didn't get it very much, but you know the line, quit crying or I'll really give you something to cry about. <laughs> I always hated that. I didn't get it a lot, but that's worn out. Um, and, uh, and there are wrong reasons to quit crying, you know. Uh, and in our society, often we're told, you know, no, that's not the adult thing to do. What was that song when I was uh, in high school? Um, um, Big Boys Don't Cry. I forget the, the tune, uh, the name of, uh, of the uh, Only Love or something. Yeah, Big Boys Don't Cry. Or sometimes we, we don't cry out of fear or denial. I was at a funeral a couple years ago. I was sitting in the congregation at another church, and uh, somebody read a poem about something where it said, uh, do not weep, I am not dead. And I thought... If you're not dead, why are we here? I remember thinking that, you know. And what if I want to weep? You're my friend, you know. I just, I just, you know. And sometimes you don't weep at, at funerals. I buried a 103-year-old a few years ago. That was a celebration. Sometimes we are asked not to cry out of fear or denial or it's just not the big thing to do. And, and I'm not, I don't want us to do that. Still, today, I really... I really want us to wipe away every tear. I want to outlaw crying this Easter. I want us to laugh and joke and smile. Why? I'm going to tell you why. And I've got three reasons. I'm still a Presbyterian today, so there's three points and a poem. And that's what I'm going to do. And I have three. You don't, you don't get a poem. You're going to get something else, and I know you'll all look forward to it. Um, uh, uh, and I've, uh, I've listed these three reasons why I want us to laugh and smile today, this Easter, and I've listed them in the sermon notes in your bulletin. The first is this. We laugh and smile this day because Jesus breathes. He breathes. Mary is crying at that tomb. Why? Because someone has stolen the body of her Lord. She doesn't know that he's standing there, breathing. He's alive. And that's why her, and then and that's why her crying doesn't make sense, because Christ is alive. He breathes. And you know what? He breathes today with us. He's alive. You know, the point of Easter, folks, is not uh, uh, just the data of Jesus being raised. It's not just that 2,000 years ago we have this data, this information, that there was an empty tomb, or this information that there were these sightings of Jesus. I think that's reliable data. But that's not all Easter is about. 
What Easter is, is that the early church made the conclusions from that data, the empty tomb and these sightings of Jesus, they made the conclusion that, in fact, Jesus is alive. That the same one who healed people by the Jordan River, who preached by the Sea of Galilee and who was tortured and crucified by the imperialistic armies, that that same one is breathing and shaking up the world. He's alive. He breathes and he sends. He's always sending and breathing so that people are moving and things are happening. Uh, one of my favorite passages, just a few verses later uh, from the one John read with us. In fact, I'm preaching on it uh, next week. And Jesus comes to his disciples. He's been raised. They're scared. And he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Jesus breathes and he sends. You know, when I was at that faith roundtable three weeks ago down in San Diego on human trafficking, there was not a tear in that entire room. It was the, one of the most energetic, passionate, joyful places I've been in in the last two years. So much energy. There's this one guy that just the day before, an elder from another church, had rescued seven children from a a uh, human trafficking ring outside of Tijuana. There was, I sat next to a 65-year-old Catholic nun who ran this four-bedroom uh, transition house for women coming out of the human trafficking scene. And what really got me, and I really knew Jesus was breathing, is there was this one seventh grader from Carlsbad, and she's involved in the middle school ministry at North Coast Calvary. And she came down with five other uh, uh, middle schoolers. I, I hope someone else drove them down there. I'm sure they did. And uh, she stood up. I didn't get a look. She was standing behind me. And they have this justice ministry in their middle school. Uh, pro. She started as justice ministry, and they raised $8,000 K, $8, to help in anti-human trafficking in San Diego County. I'm telling you, you can't cry with that. You can't. Jesus breathed. Let me tell you what else. Secondly, we smile and laugh this day, this Easter, because we are reborn. Now, I know that is a tired Christianese phrase. And let me just unpack it for you. When I say that we are reborn or we're born anew or born again, I don't necessarily mean having an emotional experience, although that often does happen. But in the New Testament, to be reborn or born again or born anew simply means living to a new direction. Not living from the past, but living to God's future which we know is a sure thing because God has raised Jesus from the dead. In your sermon notes, I have a quote from uh, 1 Peter 1.3. I love this, and this is a message translation. Uh, listen to this, 1 Peter 1. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life. Usually that's translated, we've been born anew, but brand new life, that's a wonderful translation. We've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for including a future in heaven, and that's our eternal hope, right? And the future starts now. We're reborn to a new life, and that future starts now. Not from the past, but from God's future. You know, uh, Sigmund Freud, the great uh, uh, the, uh, father of psychoanalysis, he thought everybody's agenda, uh, identity was wrapped in the question, tell me about your mother. Now, sometimes that can be a very helpful question. We do have to deal with our baggage. All of us uh, do that. Our kids will have to deal with theirs. We tell them all the time. <laughs> tell your therapist. That's what we say. Um, uh, but that was the question. But for the Christian, our identity is not captive to what's printed on the birth certificate or what's wired into our genes or what characterizes the events of our past. No, our identity is owned by the God of our, raised, our, our Jesus Christ, who has raised him. That's our identity in the future. You know, when I do premarital counseling, uh, I uh, meet with couples at least three times. And one of the questions I like to ask is, I, tell me about your, uh, your parents. And I ask them, to tell me about how they showed affection, your memories when you were a little kid. And tell me how they fought. How did they disagree? 
And I, I tell them, I, I do this because I feel like our families are the very first kind of laboratory where we learn lessons of how to be husband and wife. We're not locked into that, but it's good to know. So I had this one couple years ago, and I had just come out of fresh out of seminary, and I knew just enough to get in trouble. And uh, this one beautiful couple, and this other church I was serving, and I, we, we asked these questions, and they gave me some, shared some stuff. And then I shared something from one of my seminary professors. I probably shouldn't have, but I, I said, you know, as one of my seminary professors says, you never leave home. Oh, my gosh. This woman, she's a very tall blonde woman. I remember because she almost hit the ceiling as she jumped out of her chair. She just got in my face, and she said, I am not going to be my mother. <laughs> okay. And I finally <laughs> got her to ratchet it down a little bit. And once she sat back down in the chair, and I pushed my eyes back in my socket and picked the jaw, my jaw off the floor. I said, you know what? You're exactly right. We just have baggage we have to deal with, but you're not locked into your past. Folks, I don't care who your mother was. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what holds you captive today. But today, God owns your future. We have a brand new life. We're reborn. Because God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And we are reborn to a great light. And this is the last thing I want to say. And that is that we, last point, that um, we can laugh and smile this day because light has won. Darkness has been conquered. I know some of us don't feel that in our lives right now. We are still wounded. Some of us have battle scars. Some of us this week have battles we face. But I want to tell you ultimately to know that light has won. Sam Gamgee, Samwise Gamgee is one of my favorite characters. And I love how he is um, a person of great hope. I told you you weren't going to get a poem today. But you do get to hear from your and my favorite, J.R.R. Tolkien. And towards the end of that wonderful mis uh, fantasy novel that Tolkien wrote, Samwise Gamgee and Frodo Baggins are the last two trying to destroy the evil ring. Some of you know the story. And they've wandered into the land of Mordor, which is very dark, and it's a despairing place. They need to destroy the ring in only one place in the volcanic center of Mount Doom. And this one night, they find a camp under some shrubs, hiding. They are almost hopeless. They have little hope, and yet they are trudging on. And uh, Frodo falls asleep, and Tolkien says this about Samwise Gamgee. Then at last, to keep himself awake, Sam crawled from the hiding place of their campsite and looked out. The land seemed full of creaking and cracking and sly noises. Far above in the west, the night sky was dim and pale. There, peeping among the cloud rack uh, above the high mountains, Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart as he looked up out of the forsaken land, and hope returned to him. For like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. And now for a moment, his own fate and even his master's ceased to trouble him. He crawled back into the brambles and laid himself by Frodo's side. And putting away all fear, he cast himself into a deep, untroubled sleep. Some of you are facing battles. You go into them with courage, knowing that in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, light has won. Look, folks, <clears throat> I, I, I know there are days when we look out at our world, and there are going to be days when we look at out our, out our world, and we're going to weep. I know there are going to be days for crying but not this day. I know there will be days when we look at the brokenness of our relationships 
that that will bring tears to our eyes. But not this day. I know that there are times when the horrors of human arrogance will crush our souls. There will be days like that, but not this day. And I know that there will be days when the tragic strikes and our losses will be heartbreaking, but not this day. This day we smile because Jesus breathes. This day our eyes twinkle because we are reborn. This day we laugh because life has won. This day is Easter. This day Christ has been raised. Can I get an amen? amen. One question for you. What do you want that you don't have? You got a lot. It's a wonderful day. It's a wonderful life because we have a wonderful Savior. Gracious God, we thank you for these stories that open us to so much. Open our eyes to the wonder of your redeeming power in this world and in this life today. In Christ's name we pray, amen.